Uh, I'm John Urakam from Kyoto University, and um, this is Kohei Kato, or Japanese way Kato Kohei, from Tokyo Gakuge University. And um, what we're going to do today is um, uh, talk a bit about tabletop role playing and LARP in Japan, as more or less an entertainment practice, how it got in Japan, what are people doing there now, and then we will talk both about our respective research, where we use tabletop role playing or LARP. And um, so, short disclaimer we have both been funded by the Foundation for the Fusion of Technology and Science, a um, Japanese funding organization for, for research, so that's why the logo is up there. And with that, I'll hand over to um, uh, Kohei. And um, uh, another disclaimer, this is his very first talk in English, so... <laughs> so <we can. laughs> okay. 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 I'm from Tokyo, Japan. And you, Asakusa, Akihabara, and Kabuki. My main research tema is, uh, sorry, uh, social uh, well, social communication support of children and uh, use with uh, autism spectrum disorder using a uh, tabletop role-playing game, TRPD. <coughs> and leisure activities uh, of children and youth with SD. Uh, and uh, fandom groups of Japanese otaku culture. Uh, for example, anime, manga, light novel, and cosplayer. First, uh, I will briefly explain tabletop role-playing game in Japan. A tab the beginning of tabletop role-playing game in Japan was the late uh, 1970s. Generally, uh, TRPG began to be played in the uh, 1980s. For example, Dungeons and Dragons, Call of Duty, and Sword of World uh, role-playing game. Uh, because the Sword World role playing game rule books were distributed as a Bunkobon, uh, uh, the game spread also widely and especially among teenagers. It was not until the late 1980 when role playing video games such as a Dungeon, uh, uh, Dun uh, Dragon Quest 3 and Final Fantasy 3 helped popularize the uh, traditional role playing game. In the late 1980, replays of TRPG began to uh, be published. Replays of uh, TRPG session logs arranged for reading similar in style to write novels. Japanese TRPG acquires new player via replays. Especially, record of Road of War gained so-called so multimedia expansion. Uh, it was not produced as rule books and replays, but also made into animations, computer games, and so on. As a result, it helped spread TRPGs in Japan. In the late 19, uh, 1990, uh, the TRPG craze ended. This period is called the Winter Age of TRPG <laughs> by Japan. <laughs> but uh, in the right uh, thousands, sorry, uh, TRPG replay video have grown uh, in number on Nico Nico Doga. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, TRPG came to be known to a younger generation, generation again. Nico Nico Doga. <laughs> One, on the other, uh, other hand, uh, the application of TRPGs in communication support was recently uh, and okay, uh, continuous 
uh, to be addressed uh, in the field of education and development support in Japan. Especially, my research is focused on social communication support of children and youth with ASD. By the way, <coughs> what's ASD? ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, uh, is a kind of uh, neurological developmental disorder. Individuals with ASD are characterized by two areas of significant disability. One, uh, social communication. Two, single focus interest and or, or uh, repetitive uh, behavior. And not due to intellectual disability. Without support, um, children with ASD may have difficulty. Uh, for example, uh, initiating, maintaining, and developing, develop, uh, developing, developing a conversation in bed, classroom, or back to play, keeping up uh, with a game or understand, understanding the rule. But children with ASD have a unique talent. They may become excellent specialists in the future. Maybe researcher, artist, maybe rough designer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for the growth of the social communication skills of children with ASD, it is important to uh, experience in small groups activities among people with the same disorder characteristics. In particular, it is important to use approaches and environment environmental de designs that focus on their uh, spont uh, sorry, uh, spontaneity and in in interest. Uh, for about 10 years, I have been engaged in leisure activities using TRPGs for children, adolescents, and adults <coughs> with SD for research and uh, support purposes. Through those three research endeavors and support, we confirmed, confirmed uh, quantitatively and qualitatively uh, a change in, the, uh, in their social communication. Workshop. Uh, then, uh, then, I will present uh, some of my research. One. <coughs> Uh, promoting uh, social interaction among children with ASD using TRPG. For children with ASD, uh, participate in TRPG activities. A track <coughs> was made from an audio recording of the first and the last session. Sorry. <laughs> we defined two code in uh, uh, two codes. One intentional uh, speech directed to other children, and making consensus as follows. Result. The rate of intentional speech directed at uh, other children uh, in significantly increased in the last session. And uh, a number of make, make consensus was zero time in the first session and five times in the uh, last session. Uh, furthermore, furthermore uh, the manner of making consensus also changed qualitatively. The, uh, qualitatively, uh, uh, qualitatively. the first session mainly involved uh, uh, discuss, uh, decision by majority, whereas the last session considered uh, logical discussion by listening, uh, listening to other children's opinion. Did the children know each other before that workshop? Ah, no. Okay. Uh, first, uh, TRPG at, at activity is first contact. Okay. Mm -hmm. This uh, two uh, uh, research. Okay. <laughs> Do TRPG's activities enhance QR, uh, quality of life in children with SD? 
and the participants were uh, 50, uh, 51 teenage children with ASD. The measure was the uh, QL scale for children. The participant uh, answered the questionnaire before and after TRPG activities. The amount of uh, change in the score before and after the intervention uh, period was statistically uh, compared using t-test. Result. Mm. Uh, there was a significant uh, improvement in the total scores and subscale score of QOL. Uh, especially uh, the eff uh, effect size of emotional well-being and friend was large. Thank you. Mm. At, uh, mm, sorry. Uh, next, uh, this is interview with children and youth with ASD. Uh, participating in TRPG activity. Um, this comment is uh, Asperger, Asperger girl. Mm. Um, uh, from uh, sorry, uh, from a child otherwise uh, nervous about assessing themselves. At school, I often feel alone and separated, separate from the others. Playing TRPG with others make me happy because I don't feel that at all. Next. This comment is uh, Asperger boy. Um, sorry. Uh, I've come to uh, understand my relationship to my character. Oh, uh, it's Mari. It's Mari. Uh, so. Ch player character equal no. Not equal no. Nearly equal. This comment. Mm -hmm. Mm. For, from this comment, I assume that children with SD have acquired much focus by TRPG. Perhaps. <laughs> Conclusion. The results suggest that group activities using TRPG uh, promote in, uh, intentional communication and cooperative interaction of children with SD. Further, uh, leisure activities involving uh, TRPGs have the uh, potential to enhance QOL and relationship with pair for teenagers with SD. And characteristic uh, structure, uh, for example, rule and setting as framework of the activities, uh, clarification of roles indirect communication through a character of the story, and so on. In uh, TRPGs, might uh, be the uh, factor uh, responsible for the uh, eff uh, effectiv eff effectiveness of this intervention. Thank you. <laughs> minutes for, for direct um, questions and answers, um, but we plan to put a little bit of discussion time for bigger questions at the end. So if it's like a direct quick question. Yeah, a quick logistical question. How much, you said 16 sessions, how much time was that over? One, uh, one year and uh, six months. Okay. Do we have baseline data for people of relatively the same age in, uh, in this category and how they how they change over that same period of time? Follow-up interview. Ah, okay, so, so he's looking into that currently. Right. I think it's a complicated thing for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember, there was a, um, a test, QOL, what yeah. is that? Quality of life. Thank you. <coughs> okay. 
Yeah, so bigger questions we put to the later discussion, and um, I would like to continue now with um, LARP in Japan. Okay, briefly about myself. Um, uh, I'm trained in Japanese studies and communication and, and media studies, and um, uh, that's how I got into all of this. Um, uh, so. I'm not um, uh, uh, trained in education or, or, or I'm trained a little bit in media psychology, but not in psychological treatment. That is a disclaimer up front. Um, this is brief overview of what I'm, I'm going to talk about. So I'll give a short history of um, LARP in Japan, which should better read as how LARP was recognized in Japan, um, followed by a discussion of how I seek to use LARP in in my research on Japan, and I'll give a few uh, uh, comments about the large village shelter comfort, which we are going to run this evening. Um, okay. So, how did LARP as a practice, um, mostly for entertainment, come to Japan? Well, in certain arrangements, it was already there, it was just not named LARP. Um, uh, but I think that this self-awareness of being LARP, of doing LARP, um, uh, is very important for, for this practice as network LARP, as it opens a world to other LARPs, to see connections with other <coughs> events. Um, you can designate a number of, of cousins or sibling practices to LARP, one of which is um, cosplay, um, a LARP-like practice which focuses on dressing up as a character and is currently very much associated with Japan, so a lot of people associate the term cosplay with Japan. Cosplay or cosplay is a, um, a portmanteau made of word mixing costume and play, and um, it refers to the masquerading as a popular character, and it has its roots in the world con in the US, and the masquerade there, and the Japanese um, science fiction convention. And today it's mostly associated with the Tokyo um, uh, comic market, uh, the annual event for, for selling amateur manga and so on. Um, uh, just a few, few voices concerning cosplay and LARP. Um, the TRPG designer Okada Atsuhiro and, um, the, and Hinasaki Yu, a founder of a LARP group in Japan, um, see the major difference between cosplay and role-playing that um, uh, a role player wants to play a character in a story or a game, while a cosplayer wants to look like a character. So in, J in Japan, I know in Europe it's a little bit different, cosplay is focused on being photographed. That's the main part of the activity. Um, airsoft or survival games, sabage in Japanese, <laughs> are also quite popular, um, as are so-called uh, Breakout rooms or breakout games, that should the game, escape room, you might have heard of that, uh, where players have to solve riddles and um, uh, try to get out of a building or location. The main difference here is that you don't play a character, but you play as your, yourself. And um, <coughs> many role players in Japan know the arrangement Daibu RPG, literally live RPG. Um, despite this um, uh, live descriptor, it's totally at home in the TRPG world, so it's, it's play sessions and conventions where you move from one table to the next, and so on, and then later come together to fight a big dragon, for example. So when I first set out to invest, oh, and one more important um, uh, thing is that um, despite similarities between all of these practices, um, the overlap of people doing that is very thin. So usually cosplayers don't play role-playing games and, and vice versa. Um, so when I first set out investigating LARP in Japan, um, I had a very clear picture of what LARP meant. So, you know, fantasy, profit fighting, and so on. That was my picture of, of LARP, so I could not find that in Japan. And um, so I started to answer the question why there was no LARPing in Japan, and um, through several interviews with um, role-players, role-playing designers, and so on, I came um, to the conclusion that space in the physical sense and space in the sense that um, uh, what is sanctioned behavior in public played a major role that people felt this space wasn't there. So, um, so people said, for example, cosplayers already seen 
as strange and crazy if we run around swinging swords and spells, it would be even worse. So that was one comment I got. Um, this is what I wrote in 2011 for the Knudekund book, Why Japan Does Not LARP. Um, disregarding the more ontological question, if a whole nation can LARP, um, in the first place, only a, a year later my article became obsolete. Um, everything changed through the abridged and commented translation of the popular German fantasy LARP rule system Dragonsys in 2012. Um, on the now defunct forum of the Japan International Gamers Guild, JIC, now accessible via a meetup site, um, Jay Noyes, a long-term member of the Society for Creative Anachronism, who has a medieval fighting school in uh, Japan um, called Castle Tintagel in Mejiro. Um, he announced on that forum that he was looking for a LARP consultant because he wanted to add LARP to his portfolio of, of the school. And um, he found such a consultant in Nico Stahlberg, a German exchange student who was on his way to Tokyo. So, Nico, together with Sugiura Nobutaka, who was working at the fighting school, um, uh, created a first Japanese language LARP book after collecting information about what role players in Japan expected from such a book. And this boiled down to very strict instructions, um, procedures, as well as a pseudo medieval fantasy setting. And as Nico was mostly familiar with Dragonsys, um, this was his obvious choice to base the Japanese. Uh, rule book on. In mid-2012, they um, finally completed their work and um, made uh, the book available as a free PDF on the website of the, of the school. And um, they organized also several uh, workshops to introduce people to, to LARP, which drew an unexpected large number of female gamers. Actual player recruitment was more difficult so they had like 30 people in the workshop and then five showing up for the game. Um, but um, in total, they had, um, including one brief outdoor session, six so-called Carminia Labs until um, 2013. Um, but after Nico left for Germany, apparently there was no one who, to take over the, the game mastering mm -hmm. at Tintagel. So there are no more uh, Carminia Labs organized by them. Um, but, uh, luckily, because they were offering Patoria Soris as a free PDF um, and taught LARP through their workshops, um, uh, uh, this circumvent Tintagel is the, sole, is the only center of calculation. So, one very active participant, the aforementioned Hinasaki Yu, um, took what she learned and founded a LARP circle, a LARP group in Iruma City, Saitama Prefecture, named Salt World 1.0, so um, this is based on the classic Salt World uh, role-playing game um, Kato uh, Kohei already talked a little bit about, which was like the gold standard of role-playing in the 90s in Japan and the start of, of this multimedia franchise, Record of Lotus War, which is quite globally known, but most people do not know that this has a history going back to Dungeons and Dragons. So the players in the 80s played Dungeons and Dragons, then made these replay transcripts to publish them, and based on those transcripts, they created their own rulebook, which was Sword World RPG. So, yes. Um, Hinasaki's circle um, has approximately 30 members and flourishes until, until today, and they organize uh, monthly events in the um, uh, Iduma city community center, and um, what they do is, is more or less one room mystery adventures combined with um, European style of a we weapon fighting. The event is usually between six to eight hours long, so one, one day in um, essence. The events are very structured, built on um, scripted scenes and focus on uh, shared storytelling, encourage very much meta-thinking and um, uh, a drama-oriented play. And this drama-oriented play you can also see in, in tabletop role-playing games in Japan. And um, uh, yeah, so, so this is the, the room arrangement, for example. So they are playing one scene here, and they have this portable wall. So they can arrange the next scene there, so that when the players move from the wood into the castle, they can go there. 
Um, since 2016, they are also um, uh, they produced their own large system for horror labs, and um, that is very um, uh, going very well. And already since 2013, they published introductory guidebooks to LARPing, in which they detail how to make appropriate clothing or where to buy necessary equipment, um, such as buffer weapons, among other things, and um, how to make armor using uh, uh, easy to, 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 to get materials. Um, and these guidebooks count among the most noteworthy non-human actors in the field. So they um, uh, are available on the internet also, and um, uh, people read those guidebooks and contacted the groups that said, oh, we want to do LARP too. So last year, two new groups found, one in Kanagawa, um, Dandelion, and the other one in Chiba, Politeria, um, which usually they start both with the horror labs, because that is much easier to, to immediately start with. And, um, Yes, so also in, in um, 2016, Hinasaki and her husband founded PLOS, um, a nationwide umbrella association um, that seeks to support new groups, for example, through seminars. So they are currently holding also seminars about LARPs in Japan and um, try to broaden LARP in other directions, such as education, um, so trying to get in contact with schools, for example, or um, with corporations. Um, if you were wondering what PLOS stands for, it stands for Create Large Organization Synergy Support, but actually it's a pun, because um, uh, in Japanese you read it Kurosu, and Kurosu is where the founders live. It's, it's a district in, 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 in the outcome, so it's a little play in words. Um, they take physical and, um, uh, after many discussions, also emotional safety rather seriously, and uh, put a lot of en energy into creating a creating guidelines um, uh, for a safety mark um, that other groups can put on their on their website to to tell people well we are taking all these points into to account. And um, during that process, they were also trying to define LARP very strictly. So what can be called LARP? And I suggested to be a bit more flexible about that, and um, I think they have now found a definition um, which is, is quite flexible for them and for what they are doing. Um, uh, because general generalizations about role-playing love can only have ideal character, and um, that's why I have started with calling LARP a practice as network, because I see it see the many different forms of LARP not as um, uh, adhering to an abstract definition of LARP, and I try to get them away from finding an abstract definition, but seeing it more as a connection of different elements that um, come together in different arrangements. If you're wondering why I'm concerned with this, this is also because in, in Japanese studies there's often this main question, so what makes LARP in Japan Japanese? And I'm trying to convince colleagues that this is not a good question to ask. If you listen to um, uh, Eric yesterday about culture and so on, then you might know where I'm, where I'm going there. Um, so, because of the very specific translation history from, from a German rule book, a very much interest in Tolkien-like fantasy in, in Japan, LARP in Japan took a certain form that, to some degrees, is familiar to, to role players in Europe, and um, another connection is that um, role players in Japan buy their lab swords in England, so there are a lot of connections going on. And um, uh, also, of course, they borrow elements such as classes and, 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 and character ideas from pen and paper role playing games, so there's another connection, and they buy wigs for cosplayers to make their characters, so there are a lot of connections with these other practices, even though People talk a lot about borders between these practices. So LARP in its, um, yeah, so they're intangible material, human connections. Um, LARP in its Japanese, or I would better say Leimun form, um, to um, uh, uh, sum up a little bit, faces limitations like space that we don't have so much in Europe. And um, uh, besides that, LARPers in Japan communicate in Japanese. These three elements I would point out as characters for their kind 
of play, that there's a focus on storytelling, that they make use of items bought in Hundred Yen shops, which are actually quite cool, yes. quite yeah. good stuff. I don't know if you have something like one euro shops yeah. or so on, which is usually super crappy, mm -hmm. their family if at all. And um, the lingering stereotype is that these people are just lazy and um, are not productive for society, neither by working nor by reproducing offspring, <coughs> because they are not in a relationship with someone. And this is a major trope in conservative discussions currently, where women are sometimes called birthing machines. So. Um, yeah. Research on stereotypes has evaluated them very differently over the decades, but mostly they are seen as based on just faulty information. So what you should do is find correct information, and people will change their stereotypes. It's the ideal behind that. But in the Otaku and the Komri case, um, uh, you have many studies that try to do that, but it doesn't change. The stereotypes still remain, and um, that is why is that? Because stereotypes do not um, function based on information. Um, they are rhetorical tools to fix people in their place, to take away the history. So it's a lot about power relations, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you deliver correct information, it does actually not matter at all for a stereotype to work. Um, so instead, so I thought instead of writing another article that tells everyone what hikikomori are actually like, um, and because of my experience in LARPing, I seek to translate my research into an spiritual form. And um, this follows the tenet of show, don't tell, and more precisely um, is inspired by performance, performance ethnography, um, where, for example, exhibitions and the like are organized together with the people being researched. Um, the problem I see here is that the audience is still just an audience, still just only gets third-person experience. So, um, bearing Kaisa Kanga's uh, uh, comments on experimental anthropology and its limits in mind, um, I still thought LARP might be a better idea. So, and um, this LARP I, um, uh, uh, I will briefly talk about is um, Village Shelter Comfort. Or in Japanese, Anshin um, Kara Game, Escape from <coughs> Comfort. And um, during my field work, many of my informants, be they former hikikomori or therapists, said that individual therapy and support is very important, but that it only treats the symptom. Um, hikikomori should not only be seen as a problem, but also as a chance to, to think about society, to think about new ways of life. What, ne what needs treatment is the social environment. And um, based on such repeated statements, and also because I'm not a therapist, um, when I present my, my work at, at, at conferences, people often assume I want to treat hikikomori with, with my LARP, but that's not the aim. My aim is to, to raise awareness, to make people think about hikikomori um, by getting a small glance at dilemmas some hikikomori face. And secondarily, um, um, the LARP is also designed to test a method for lab learning evaluation um, for which I received the FOST funding mentioned in the beginning. Um, the setup of the lab was based on discussions with um, uh, my informants and also other ex hikikomori So it is not representative of how all hikikomori feel or what factors in their withdrawal. It's just one tiny bit here. Um, and um, uh, one of my problems I have is I, I hope to not only draw the attention of those who are already, already interested in hikikomori, who also have something at stake because a family member is, is hikikomori. Um, so um, in, in Japanese, I don't call it a hikikomori larp. Um, playing with the fame of escape rooms, I call it escape from comfort. So, so this plays a little bit or two, relates a little bit to the ambiguity of the hikikomori situation, that many are aware they actually want to go out, but can't. So, which is like an, an uh, uh, um, so the graduating cycle. Thank you. Um, and I thought because and it won't work to tell people immediately to play the comedy, the lab um, has three scenarios, which, um, so it's more or less, you can say, three mini-mini LARPs in one. 
moments. And um, they are coming closer and closer to the contemporary every day. Um, in each scenario, the players um, face um, the dilemma of either leaving um, and facing an, an, an unknown outside world, or dealing with um, a familiar world in which their comfort, in which what they cherish about that world is gradually um, uh, diminishing, or they even experience threats to their, to their lives. These are pictures from the first um, uh, test play run. We had two in Japanese. Today will be the first one in, in English. And um, I designed the lab as simple as possible um, so that also others find more or less easy access to it so that I can, can give the, the, the design document to, for example, people who are um, in, in NGOs to help Hikikomori can, can run this without thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to run to castle. Mm -hmm. So um, if you are interested to, to um, learn a bit more about that, um, uh, I will um, put the design do document hopefully, hopefully up on my homepage in, in April. And um, uh, some of you might have signed up for, for, this, for this evening. If you are on the waiting list, we have two um, NPC spots, so it's not the, the, the player spots, but if you, if you want to still, still to participate in it and you're on the waiting list, please come to me uh, uh, during the day and um, I would be glad if you could join that way also. And um, as a last point, the evaluation tool for lab learning I mentioned is based on a mixed method called pack analysis. Um, a personal attitude construct analysis um, developed by um, the Japanese psychologist Naito Tetsuo and um, I talked about this a little bit at some Kota last year and um, uh, if you want the script for that talk uh, I can also send it to you or you find it on my, on my website. In essence, during the debriefing you produce such graphics which will then be used as a basis for further reflection um, with the, with the players, with the participants, and um, uh, you can also use these pictures, these graphics, for grant applications. So, people who are obsessed with numbers, you can say, oh look, here, great number, no, chart, good, <laughs> important. Um, uh, the lab for, for tonight is planned until 9 o'clock, but we have another hour left, so if you don't want to rush off to see um, the drag uh, 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 show, you can uh, join us for, for a mid Senate debriefing where I could show you this method too. Or we can do it on Saturday or Sunday. That's my part. We have very few minutes left, but um, 